It's weird to kind of say we celebrate this week, right? Because it's hard to think about celebrating when you think about the fact that Jesus went to the cross for us. But yet it is a time of celebration and he wants us to celebrate. Yes, he wants us to think about everything that he went through. He wants us to feel some of that. He wants us to engage with him at that level, the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. So why? So that we might know him more. Thank you, son. We, we're called to know him more. We're called to experience him more. It is true that, that we experience him in our worst of times and in our best of times. So when we talk about celebration, it is relative to the fact that he completed the work. That's why we celebrate. The work is complete. The work is finished. Because he was broken, we now have wholeness. You are whole now because he was broke. It gives him honor and respect when we remember what he did this week. Multiple times in the Word of God it is said, remember the feasts. This time of year you shall remember. Remember the Passover. Remember the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He tells us over and over and over again, this is the time to remember. Why? Because he wants us to know how much we mean to him. He wants us to know how much he loved us. He wants us to know how important we are to him, how much value we have. I know sometimes you look in the mirror and you think to yourself, I, ha I don't have any value. How could Jesus die for me? Listen, what he sees in you, you can't even possibly see in yourself. The dream and the destiny he has for you, you haven't even been able to put together those blocks yet. You can't see what he sees. But if you ask him to give you a glimpse of your hope, your future, what's coming. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we have a future. We all have a future. We have a future of eternal life. We have a future of life in the earth realms, living as though we're in heaven. Man, you can't ask for a better deal. You didn't go to the cross. He went to the cross. He says, pick up your cross and carry it just like I did. But I'll tell you right now, none of us will carry the cross that he carried. There's not one person on this planet that will ever carry the cross that he carried. But if we can even carry just a little bit of something, he's going to teach us how. Through what he did, we are more than overcomers. We are more than victors. We are conquerors in every way. So, yes. There is a time of celebration, but there is a time to remember the feast. And we're going to do that on Saturday night. We're going to remember the feast. We're going to have a Seder meal, Passover Seder. If you haven't gotten your tickets yet, you got to get your tickets. I'm telling you, Pastor Adam and I would never miss this. It is such a blessing. It's three hours, but it's three hours of intimacy with the Lord. It's three hours of sitting in his presence. It's three hours of worshiping him. And yes, you also get a blessed meal for sure. But get your tickets. Bring a friend. It is a time to learn about the exodus from Egypt that the Israelites took, they, how they, they put the blood on the doorposts, and then they exited and then they went to go into the promised land. And so it's a story of the importance of that time, which is celebrated this week uh, in Israel. All week long is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It ends on Sunday, which is our Resurrection Sunday. And so Saturday night, we want you to come to the Seder meal. I know you're praying and fasting and you're preparing yourself to bring an offering on Sunday, and you should be doing these things. These are the things that we do because we love the Lord, because there's nothing that we could possibly do for Him that even remotely, remotely uh, comes to what He has done for us. What He has done for us is so vast, so great, so amazing that we would have eternal life. Whoo, hallelujah. And come on Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, yes. Come on to the 1030 service. We are also going to have bounce houses for the kids during the service. They will actually have fun doing the bounce houses and all that. After service, we're going to have an egg hunt for them. We're going to have some hot dogs. But listen, that's not why we come. 
We come to celebrate that that day he is risen. And he has risen indeed. All right. And that's what we, that's what we high five about. That's what we get so excited about. Because see, when he rose, that means we rose. The Apostle Paul tells us that in Romans chapter 5 and 6. He says, you died with Christ, you were buried with him, and you resurrected in him. You are now a new creature. You have the DNA of the Lord, and you're called now to live it out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know about anybody else. I think I'll be the only one on fire in this house today. I'm definitely on fire. I had quite the day today. I don't know if y'all had a chance to see it or not, but you can watch it later. But I had the honor of interviewing. Well, it wasn't even really an interview, but I had Sid Roth on my program today. And he blessed the world with Passover on the Glory Road Show. And he taught about the exodus from Egypt. He taught it from a Jewish perspective. And then he did communion. And so I want to encourage you to go and watch that program because it will be an awesome way to reflect on what Passover really means. And you get to hear it from him, which... uh, which is truly awesome. So I was blessed today with that. One of the things prophetically the Lord wanted me to speak to you all today is you're crossing over, okay? Passover is a time of crossing over. Just as the Israelites crossed over the Red Sea and then they entered into the land. Obviously, they were in the desert for 40 years before they crossed fully into the Promised Land. But they had escaped. They had exited Egypt. The Lord had set them free from bondage. And so I know that there's been a lot of spiritual warfare going on. I know there has been, okay? And that's normal for this week. But here's the deal. When you push back, you got to push back on the enemy. See, you don't let him run you over. You push him back, all right? And you declare and decree and you speak life over your situations, whatever it is. And you'll conquer the spirit of death when you keep that heart attitude. Jesus conquered the spirit of death and he conquered the spirit of death this week. But there's always going to be a snake or a serpent that tries to push you back. But this is a special time because as you're crossing over here, we cross over at Passover in the month of Nisan before we go into the month of ER. And what we're doing is we're setting a framework. There's new aspects of your destiny that are being created right now. And you're going to carry them out for the next six months until Rosh Hashanah, which I believe happens on September 6th. And that would be the head of the year, which is the second new year on the Hebrew calendar. So this six months is called the spring rain. So what happens is we push ourselves into our destiny this six months. And then in September, everything doubles for us. That's when we go into double portion time. So these six months are very important. Because God aligns us. He gives us divine alignments and assignments. He positions us. He makes us stronger. He allows us to step into different aspects of our destiny, meeting new people, um, engaging in new opportunities, um, receiving additional, you know, new revelation that comes from heaven, walking out our, uh, the different anointings that you've been given or the use of the spiritual gifts. So this is a time where you press through the fear, you press through anything that might possibly be hindering you and holding you back. I mean, literally, you just kick it and begin to start moving. Because as you start moving here, you will gain speed and momentum, which will then double itself in the fall time frame. So it's very important that no matter what spiritual warfare you're going through, you have the victory. You automatically have the victory. This is part of the test for your destiny and for your promise, okay? So it's as though uh, everyone is faced with something during this time, but that something is a key aspect to the hope and future that you have. See, we don't have all that many years to live in the earth realm, but we have a whole lot of years to live in the eternal realm. So what you do here in the earth realm 
as I've been teaching about it from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, these are works that were created in advance for you to do, to bring glory to the Lord. So we're only given a certain amount of time on this planet, and believe me, that's all we really want, right? We want to spend eternity in the glory with him. And so we've been given this time span, and so the Lord wants us, and every six months he rotates things. Every six months. And they can go faster and faster and faster depending upon how obedient you are to push into the enemy and to press forward and to do what it is that God is calling you to do. Don't allow hindrances, fear, all of those kinds of things hold you back. Step into what it is that God has for you. When you push in, then you're going to start to see things really rolling. And, you know, all of our dreams, all of our destinies are different for all of us, okay? And they're supposed to be different, right? We're not supposed to have destinies that are the same. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on the earth, and there's a lot of us that need to be connecting with each other and and developing relationships and making seed deposits of the Word and and, uh, aspects of Jesus, giving that one to another. And so we don't all have the same destinies, and our paths will cross maybe just for a short period of time. But you have been given a responsibility to do something with that. And part of that is kicking the butt of the enemy and telling him, no, he cannot have this space. He cannot have this environment. He cannot have what it is that he is pressing up against. All right. You've got to push back. I see too many people and they just like, what are you doing? Get up and conquer that spirit of death, that spirit of decay. Something's coming to kill you in your early years. Stand up and fight against that thing. Right? Do not just accept every word that's been spoken to you by somebody who calls themselves a professional. The bottom line is, if we position ourselves to walk and stay the course, we will press in to the destiny that God has called us to press into. Anything that has value is worth working for, and it hurts to accomplish it. You ask anybody. Ask my husband. My husband is the king of consistency. That man, no matter what you put before him, he will push at that thing. He will punch at that thing. He will keep going on that thing. And I tell you, the devil cannot kill him because he constantly keeps going no matter, the, no matter what. Stay the course. Stay the course. Even when you don't understand it, even when it looks confusing, even when it seems like it's a mess, stay the course that God has called you to because eventually you will pass through. And this is a time passing through, okay? That's why it's it's called Passover, right? Because when the angel of death came to judge the, the gods of Egypt, all those that Jesus loved, all those that God had set apart, put blood on their door frames. And when that angel came to judge the gods, those who were sat under that blood were saved and redeemed. And then they were fully delivered from that bondage. Now, that's a picture of what he does for us every day, folks. Every day. We always read it this time of year. But their life is a picture of us to grab a hold of and say, he did this to show us his goodness. I will stand in what he has revealed in his word about himself, about his faithfulness, about his goodness. Never doubt the goodness of God. The devil will always get you if you doubt the goodness of God. Never doubt the goodness of God. If you ever begin to start wondering whether or not God loves you and whether or not he's really good, you just slap yourself really hard. Okay? Because you just got taken off by some little devil into some little zone. See, the minute we start thinking anything about God that's not true, he's going to take us off the path. We got to stay on the path. Hallelujah. Now, I want to just remind you from Sunday, I mentioned that every time you come to a new portal or a new gate, a new door, which is what happens during this time of year, you enter into new gates, there is always at the threshold, all right, an asp that sits there to challenge you as to whether or not you're going to get through the gate. Most of the time, this asp will have the appearance of fear, okay? And it'll be fear that's generated from a variety of different means. Like, 
I'm afraid I don't have enough money. I'm afraid I'm not healthy enough. I'm afraid somebody won't like me if I do this. I'm afraid I'll lose my job. It always is a fear that is related to some level of provision, protection, and acceptance that sits there. The ask challenges you, all right? But you got to challenge it back. You got to pull out your sword of the spirit. You got to kill that thing at the threshold so that you can go through. And if you look at your life from the time that you can remember till now, you have these moments. You've seen how you've conquered certain aspects, and you've also seen how you've pulled back and said, oh my gosh, I can't do it. Send somebody else, God. Not me. You must not be calling me to do it. Send somebody else. Come on. And so take those times, the time that you're in right now. If you feel the fear now or the next couple of days, take out your sword and kill that sucker and get through the gate. So then when you come back here on Sunday, when you come to the Seder meal, you celebrate the fact that not only did Jesus resurrect, but you got through your portal into the space and place where your destiny is now in its next level, in its next six months of going to new places in God. All right? We're all responsible for what it is that God gives us. That's why, it's, that's why the Word tells us that when He sees us, He's going to say, good and faithful servant. Right? You've been a good and faithful servant. Enter the kingdom. Why is He going to say that? He's going to say that because we were faithful. It didn't mean we weren't without pain. It didn't mean we weren't without ang angst. It didn't mean that we didn't have fear, anxiety, depression, all the things that come, sickness in our body. Yes, we have those things, but we were taught how to overcome those things. Come on. And he's going to say, what did you do with what I taught you? What did you do with the word? What did you do? Did you maneuver that word? Or did you sit back and let those devils eat you up? Because let me tell you what, them devils will have you for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they will not stop. Then they'll have you for the next day too. Right? They will not quit. You can't quit. Don't you quit because they won't quit. This is why I love my husband so much is because that man will not quit. He will not quit. He is consistent. He will not quit. No devil likes somebody who will not quit. And the people of God should have that much power because they are equipped with it, but they should know how to use it in such a way that they are unstoppable. I mean, think about it. We never die, do we? I, I know you thought you died, but you never die. If you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you will never die. Look to your neighbor and say, I will never die. See, that spirit on the inside of you, that spirit is alive. It's never going to die. Therefore, you will never die. Do you hear what I'm saying? You will never die. I mean, if you were the devil, wouldn't that freak you out? Them folks have the power of God on the inside of them, and they're never going to die. No matter what I do to them, I may push their flesh. I may challenge their souls. But those folks, they are never going to die. Especially the ones that know Jesus. They're the only ones that are going to live forever. That's why it's so important to know our Lord and Savior. Come on. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the Word. That was really long. That, that's called the prologue to the Word. Maybe it's like the prolong to the Word instead of the prologue to the Word. Okay. So I want us to think about this, okay, because tonight is a tribute to my Savior. Tonight is a tribute to my Jesus. Tonight is a tribute to the one who saved me from sin, death, and the grave, who resurrected me, who gives me life, who without him I'd have nothing. Do you realize that? Without him you'd have nothing. No treasure on this planet amounts to his presence, his glory, none of it, none of it. And I'm telling you, when you get to heaven, you won't need one thing from here. You won't need one thing from here. Though you'll take your memories with you, the good ones, you'll need nothing from here. When you get in his presence, all you want is him. And you don't even know who you are. You just forgot about yourself. That's the beauty of it. 
So tonight is a tribute to him because we all love him. Now, I want you to stand because I'm going to read a scripture that is very, very intense. And I want you to think about this because over the next couple of days, this is what the story of the Exodus is all about. Okay, You read the story of Exodus in Exodus 12 and 13. I want you to read it. Okay, You read it on your own. Study it on your own. But this set of scriptures is who he is to us. This is Isaiah 53. You'll see some of it on the screen, but you won't see all of it on the screen. So listen. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot. And like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yes, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin... He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And that is the word of the Lord. Just lift your hands in this place. Lord, we are humbled, we are grateful each one of us, Father, was one that you hung for. You came to this earth despised and broken, yet you continued to bring people life. You showed them miracles, you showed them who the Father was so that we could have God as our Father. All because of what you have done, we now have life and we have it everlasting. No words can express our gratefulness to you, Father, for what you have done. We will not rot in hell. We will not be those afflicted because you, Father, have taken that for us. We thank you, Father, for making us whole in spirit, soul, and body. We thank you, Lord, that no matter what we're going through right now, your word says that we are healed by your stripes. 
We thank you, Father, that right now in this place you are healing things, Lord, that are out of place. Healing hearts, healing bodies, Lord Jesus, healing relationships, Father. And we thank you, Lord, that you came to bring that life, that prosperity, that fullness, that nothing missing, nothing broken. There's nothing that we could say or do that could ever repay you for what you have done for us. And we humble our souls before you. We ask for forgiveness for anything, Lord Jesus, that we're holding on to, any unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, Lord Jesus, any anger or malice, greed or jealousy, Lord. We ask you, Father, to remove the darkness from our soul in any way. If there's even, even a speck of darkness, Father, that you would wash it away with water of the word and with your blood, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you. We have nothing in common with the enemy, Lord, because of what you have done on the cross for us, and we will stand in that. We will stand bold and brave with our swords and with the word of God, with our helmet of salvation and our blessed breastplate of righteousness and our belt of truth and our shoes of the gospel of peace, Lord Jesus, Father. We thank you, Lord, for everything you've given us in Ephesians chapter 6. There is no reason why we shall not be victorious, Lord. There is no excuse. There is nothing that we could possibly say that would position us not to be the victors. Because you are the victor, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with the opportunity to live in a space and place of joy and peace. And that we can make this our free will choice. And we freely choose to have joy and peace because you went to the cross for us. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the joy that was set before you that you went to the cross. That same joy come upon us, Lord Jesus, every day when we remember how you suffered that we might have life. Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much. We thank you for the power in this room right now, Lord. We thank you for the cleansing and the purification that's taking place right now. Woo! So you all feel that. Woo! He's cleansing right now. He's purifying right now. Lord, we thank you. Every, every dark spot is being removed right now. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for every broken heart, Lord. For every loss. For every weakness, Lord Jesus, Father. For every pain that we have in our souls, Lord, every grief from the loss of a loved one, Father, we ask you, Lord, to touch us now, Father, because you are the giver of life. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. We thank you for assurance of salvation. We thank you right now, Father, that we are assured of our salvation. If you are sure of your salvation, raise your hand right now. I want to see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These are the saints of the Lord, assured of their salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you that we will hold our assurance of salvation near to us, Lord Jesus, as we stand firmly and march through the gates into our destiny because we are crossing over at this time. Thank you, Lord. Woo, glory, glory, glory. Somebody give him a hand clap. <laughs> Jesus. Woo, hallelujah. Y'all can be seated. Wow, that kind of sheds light on his whole purpose, huh? I want to read to you John chapter 6. Because of what he did, this is what he said to his disciples. You know you're his disciple. Come on. You're his disciple. You're his beloved. And this is what he says to you in John chapter 6. He says, 
Truly I tell you, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, the disciples said, sir, always give us this bread. Can I hear you say, always give us this bread? Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Ooh. But as I told you, he said, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. This is good news for us. Once connected to the Father, we will never be driven away. And he says it when he says, still you do not believe, it's because he's trying to drive a, a very important message to them. Like, listen, this is deep core soul stuff. He says that whoever comes to me, I will never drive away, and I've given to my Father. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Come on. Look to your neighbor and say, I will not be lost. Come on. He says that none, none of us, none of us that receive him will be lost. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. Woo! Hallelujah. High five your neighbor. Because we will not be lost. We have eternal life. We have connection with the Father. You know you can call God your Father. Do you know that we could not do that had he not done what he did, had he not gone to the cross? Now, this time of year, there are seven blessings that we are given. I go through them every year. I'm going to go through them again. This is from Exodus chapter 23. Because of what he has done, we are given seven blessings during this season. From Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 22. You won't see the scriptures up here, but you will see the blessing. I want you to read this on your own. Do some homework this week. Exodus 23, verses uh, 20 through 32. All right? 20 through 33. All right? So here we go. Exodus 23, verses 20 through 22 is blessing number one. See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and I will oppose those that oppose you. Blessing number one is that God will assign an angel to you. Now, why would God say that he's going to assign an angel to you? You already have a guardian angel. Why do you need another angel? Because every time we cross into new realms, we need new angelic assistance. Now, these angels come and go. You may have one aside for you this time, and then they may go, and they may be assigned somewhere else, and you get another one, okay? Some of you have the same angels for your whole life. Some will get angels for specific assignments that do specific things, okay? But he says that at this time of year, he will assign an angel to you. Hallelujah. High five your angel. Come on. Come on. High five your angel. Oh, you guys got him. Yes, you do. You got your guardian and you got your new one. Okay, Exodus 23, verses 20 through 24. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Havites, and Jebusites. I don't know where that is, but no, <laughs> that's in the promised land. And I will wipe them out. So this new land that God is taking you to, God's going to wipe out the enemy. Do not bow down before the gods or worship them that are in this new land. Come on, some of y'all are going to go to your new land, and you're going to be faced with some gods, some demons, some things you have not yet seen before. 
Do not worship them. Do not rub up against them. Do not pet them. Do not make friends with them. All right? You have one God, and that is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Word says that you must not bow down before them, before the gods, or worship them, or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Blessing number two is God will be an enemy to your enemies and protection for you and your family. Hallelujah. Somebody high five again. High five your angel. Come on. Them angels are a part of that protection. Okay. Exodus chapter 23, verses 25 through 26. This is blessing three, four, and five. Okay. There's three blessings in these scriptures. So we go into the new land. What are we supposed to be doing? Worship the Lord your God, and his blessing will be on your food and water, on your provisions, okay? I will take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. In other words, the spirit of death will be conquered. Blessing number three is God will give you prosperity. Blessing number four is God will take sickness away from you. And blessing number five is God will give you a long life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, the next set of blessings is in Exodus chapter 23, verses 27 through 30. This is when we're entering the land. He says, I'm going to send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. All right, so that's any, anything that, that thinks they have possession of that thing, well, you're getting ready to possess that land, so they're going to have to go, okay? And then he says, I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive the Havites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way, but I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. In other words, he wants to strengthen you in the new land. He's going to let you go kind of bit by bit here and knock down a few of them gods, a few of them idols, a few of them enemies, and then he's going to cause you to lift your muscles some so you get strong and confident before you continue on for more of the land. And he says, because little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the whole thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So blessing number six is God will cause increase to come to you. All right, there's going to be increase. And this increase is not necessarily wage prosperity. It's non-wage prosperity. It can be wage or non-wage, okay? So I'm going to pray financial blessings upon you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. But before any blessings come from heaven, you need to have non-wage prosperity. What that means is you need to be able to position yourself as the head of what it is that you're stepping into. See, God doesn't bless something financially until he knows the head can handle it, right? So he gives what's called non-wage prosperity first, which is an increase of authority to be able to stand in this place and then receive the wealth of heaven so that you can operate completely and possess the lamb. All right? So we're going to high-five our angel again because we get non-wage prosperity obtained through position and then high-five the other side and say, yeah, financial blessings are coming. Hallelujah. Because once you step into that, you're going to need a little bit more to keep it going. Exodus 23, 31 through 33, this is the last blessing. I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert to the river. I will hand over you to the... I will hand over to you the people who live in the land, and you will drive them out before you. Do not make a covenant with them or with their gods. Do not let them live in your land, or they will cause you to sin against me, because the worship of their gods will certainly be a snare to you. Notice how he says that multiple times in Exodus 23. He's saying that because he knows that what we don't know can actually be a snare to us right? He knows that when, when we cross over and we step into new territory and our eyes get big and we start to see all that he has given us, that we can easily be confused and easily lured, easily mistaken because of our needs for provision, protection, and acceptance. And we may fall prey to a demon that begins to speak to us and we don't even realize it. So he tells us this, stay close to me in your heart. And if you do, you will not be ensnared by the enemy. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. 
Every new thing that you go to, there is always things there that you don't know. You're not familiar with that land. You don't know everything about this place. You think you do, but you don't. And he's saying, kids, you don't always know what's there, but if you'll worship me, I'll take care of you in the midst of it, and I'll give you the wisdom to, to fight that enemy. So blessing number seven is God will give you a special year's blessing. All right, high five your angel. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the seven blessings of the Passover. Hallelujah. If the man wants to come up. Ooh. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Lord. That's right, Pastor Dina. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, listen, we have to be reminded of this every year. That's why he says, remember the feasts. Remember the feasts. This is why we come to his party three times a year. This is his party week, okay? I know it's really a difficult party to go to this week because it's the Passover party, okay? It's a difficult time, but it's a time of year where we remember that he won, okay? All right? It's hard for us to think about the suffering, and we got to think about that, folks. You got to, okay? That's why Isaiah 53, because it humbles us. To step into the new land, you have to have humility. You have to know that you're still hanging on to your daddy while you're in the new place. And that he made a way for that. We can never get too proud. He tells, us, he tells the Israelites that in, in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says that he did not want them to become so proud that they would think that they had obtained this wealth for themselves. Right? See, all the wealth is coming to you. For the occupation of the new land is coming because it's good for God that you're in this land. It's because he destined you to be there. It's because his name is on you. And when you go to that place, you carry his name. See, people understand destiny. They understand that. They understand that it's not them, that it's him. And they're following through with the calling. And they're stepping in to the place that God has called them so that his glory would come forth. And so that people would raise their hands and say, praise the Lord for the work that he has done. And we should always remember this. Our humanity responds differently. I'm just going to say a prayer and just... Pray us out of here. We're going to have the worship te- uh, the uh, altar team come up. The worship team is already here. The altar team is going to come up. If you, if you have a prayer request and you want to talk to them, please come up to them tonight. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this Wednesday night service. Before we step into tomorrow, which would be the Lord's Supper. Friday, which is Good Friday. Saturday, which is your day of burial, Lord Jesus. And Sunday, which is the day you rose from the grave. We thank you, Lord. We remember you. We remember the feast, the feast of unleavened bread. We are grateful, Father, in every way. You know our hearts, Father. You know how grateful we are. So, Lord, just touch us in this last song, Lord Jesus, as we worship you, Father. Draw us unto you, Lord Jesus. Take us to deeper places. I pray right now for supernatural encounters, dreams and visions for you over the next couple of days. May any blinders come off your eyes and anything that's stuck in your ears come out right now in the name of Jesus. Your nose, may you smell the fragrance of heaven. May you taste the goodness of the Lord. And may you touch the hem of his garment. Father, we praise you and we thank you. You're going to make our senses come alive to you over the next few days. Angelic encounters, in Jesus' name, amen.